Hello, Uta Hagen here of YouTube channel Trans Widow Uta Hagen and Memoir in the Curated Woods True Tales from a Grass Widow. This is I Universe published in 2022. It's getting to be two years. Uh, I will be doing a little more reading from it in uh, a future video. Uh, right now, Oh yes, and also my uh, WordPress blog is utahagangrasswidow.wordpress.com. Grass widow being a phrase dating back to 1526 for a married woman who is honorably separating from her husband and living alone. Um, I promoted that idea uh, and that phrase instead of trans widow because I don't really like the word trans and all of the new ways in which um, it has been uh, converted and uh, manipulated um, in our time. And I'm also very happy to report to you <laughs> that um, I'm seeing uh, much more completely because uh, about five days ago my left eye was done. As a matter of fact, I kept wondering what that is. <laughs> and that is part of the mark that they put on you so that they know they are operating on the correct side. <laughs> and that will disappear in time. I, I didn't even get to wash my hair for a few days. It's, it's quite a remarkable uh, experience to have my sight really becoming uh, diminished, um, dangerous to me in terms of crossing the street, that type of thing, and then to have it restored by having the lens with the cataracts um, removed and replaced with silicone lenses. Um, now, I might have to have glasses. We're letting all this settle. We'll see. It's um, very strange for me as a person who, f since I was eight years old, I had glasses. And uh, such nearsightedness that um, uh, I never misplaced my glasses or walked around saying, where are my glasses? I always knew where I had put them down. Um, now, today's topic is about a an organization called Do No Harm. And uh, I'm going to be reading from an article that was in City Journal by Ian Kingsbury. And uh, he titled this, Doubt as a Badge of Honor. Now, the Do No Harm organization, which Ian Kingsbury is one of the founders of, is uh, specifically uh, working on the misinformation uh, that is being promoted by uh, what I call cross-sex ideology and what is um, mostly referred to as trans ideology. Uh, we know from the uh, plethora of new identities that have been introduced, not just that you think you're actually the opposite sex, uh, now with many flavors of so-called non-binary, that um, it it has no boundaries. It just goes farther and farther and farther. Uh, there are even um, proponents of uh, all children having the choice of avoiding puberty. So, um, you know, it, it just goes farther and farther and farther into the netherworld. Um, I mean, I was I was confused going through puberty. I was I was kind of a skinny young teenager, didn't get um, the kind of breasts that were going to impress the boys in in the late 1960s. Um, but I'm I'm really happy with 
with how everything has turned out now. <laughs> and uh, the comfort of being comfortable in your own body, being connected mind and body, um, cannot be emphasized enough. This is something we need to start teaching children instead of waving pastel colored flags at them. So I'm just going to go through this and add um, some of my trans widow perspectives on this. This was in uh, City Journal uh, just recently, maybe even today. Um, Do no harm's efforts to expose the scandal of sex trait modification in gender nonconforming minors are getting noticed. So that means that instead of just defaming us or immediately saying that that we're bigots, they're having to answer the truths with which do no harm as an organization and I as an individual uh, that we are um, exposing, exposing scandal of sex trait modification in gender nonconforming minors. And I pose that even in adults that the decisions are coerced and rushed and um, this new film which I uh, posted a link to on our community page called The Lost Boys features both Alexander L, the Norwegian detransitioner, and Richie Heron, the British detransitioner, who uh, both did these surgeries and um, wrong sex hormones and so on as adults. And they both felt that uh, this was all a big mistake. They were rushed into it when, when they were feeling badly um, after starting down into that rabbit hole. Then what they were told was, that's because you're not going fast enough. And there's a really sad story from uh, the, the Lost Boys uh, about Alexander L. because as he was being sedated for the surgeries, his mind was saying, I think this is a mistake. But he was literally a prisoner of the sedation at that point, and he couldn't do anything. So it's a very sad, alarming, and poignant story. So, to continue, in a recent manuscript published in the Journal of Social Science and Medicine, authors Joanna Woost, uh, her last name is spelled W-U-E-S-T, and Brianna Last, identify Do No Harm, where this guy Ian Kingsbury is director of research. They name him as an agent of scientific uncertainty in discussions of the safety and efficacy of so-called gender-affirming care, which I call a uh, sex trait uh, modification treatments and surgeries. They, meaning Wust and Last, intended the agent of uncertainty label as an insult, but we wear it as a badge of honor. Doubt is a bedrock of scientific inquiry, an essential tool to separate opinion from fact. As Wust and Last see it, however, they say in quotes, medical and mental health associations across the globe have widely accepted gender-affirming care for children and adolescents. They seem to think that doubt, asking basic questions, is antithetical to science. And I asked some of those basic questions way back in the early 1990s when my ex, Nettie, who claims to be a woman, claims to be the mother of our children, um, I tried to reason with him and say, you will never consider yourself to be real as a female because you saw me deal with periods and pregnancy and childbirth and nursing our children. And you know that you never could and never did that. And, uh, you know, he would break down in tears. I would just be calmly saying this. And then he would call me names. 
I'm lucky that I guess that he didn't try to strangle me because in my data of 56 of us, there were four or five cases of attempted strangulation by the now ex-husband. European countries have conducted systematic reviews of the safety and efficacy of pediatric gender medicine and have pulled back on the practice as a result, especially the Scandinavian countries. They have cited their doubts that the benefits of so-called gender-affirming care outweigh the risks. They have doubts. In the United States, the supposed consensus in favor of the practice is illusory, meaning it is a mirage, it is an illusion, it is pretend. Physicians at the Endocrine Society's annual meeting, for example, reported widespread skepticism about the merits of hormone therapy for minors and noted their reluctance to speak out for fear of professional retribution from transgender activists. So these uh, medical associations really need to protect their doctors. The specious consensus on gender medicine is forged through activism and maintained through attempts to stifle debate, the very tactic that Wust and Last use in their piece. Now, I don't know, um, I didn't read it thoroughly enough before starting this. I am wondering, they both have uh, female first names, and I am wondering if they are netties, actually men who think of themselves as women. I've got a problem with my... <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I'm going to actually continue with this. Um, for some reason, my screen went blank, but I think things continued. <laughs> Uh, the authors claim that medical and mental health associations have shifted away from the goal of preserving a child's assigned gender identity, meaning <laughs> their entire body, <laughs> uh, and toward aff affirmation of a child's sense of self. This accurately reflects the views of U.S. medical associations, which are fundamentally doctor advocacy unions, I would say that they are arms of uh, advertising, basically, uh, but not those of European health authorities. Recently published draft guidance for schools in the United Kingdom, for example, specifically advise school officials to allow for watchful waiting. I think there should be very sensible mind-body movement interventions uh, for gender distressed youth. The draft guidance recognizes even social transition as an active intervention. Yes, social, so-called social transition um, gives more doubt to that person because they know that people are pretending with them. <laughs> people are still you know, now this is, this is uh, uh, 30 years later. Um, I, as uh, more than 30 years later, I found his diaries in 1992. Now he had all the surgeries Nettie did, but he knows that he doesn't look or sound like a woman and that he doesn't act like a woman. And uh, he knows that he has usurped my role as mother. And, uh, he knows that this is abusive to me and our children. Um, that's why he has to express himself in more and more extreme language and why he has to be more and more aggressive verbally towards me. Uh, so this is the draft guidance uh, in, the, in uh, Europe. Um, the, uh, they're saying that um, uh, the social transitioning has the potential to lock in gender confusion and put a healthy child on a pathway to medical harm. Finnish and Swedish health authorities, meantime, recommend psychotherapy as the main treatment for youth gender dysphoria, which I call cross-sex ideation, with hormonal interventions 
reserved for the most extreme cases and given only in research settings. Now, I would also pose that the most extreme cases actually are people who have other, as they're often called, comorbidities or other coexisting conditions, um, such as uh, uh, disorder of identity, where they are multiple personality disorder. Okay, Wust and Last's citation of a recently published randomized control trial as evidence in favor of pediatric gender medicine is also misleading. Whenever they start claiming this settled science uh, idea, you really have to become a researcher and look at the studies that they are quoting because uh, this one uh, did not go on for long enough. And this is an Australian study. In the cited trial, some Australian participants seeking access to cross-sex hormones received a waiver from the traditional three-month waiting period. So they were only asking children to wait for three months before getting for a female testosterone and for a male estrogen, or possibly for uh, what they call uh, a hormone uh, blocking, puberty blocking, which is something like Lupin. It's a gonadotrophin an antagonist. Uh, so Australian participants seeking access to cross-sex hormones received a waiver. They got uh, expedited. Um, and then after three months, surveyed, surveys revealed better measures of mental health. Now, this just has to do with the euphoria that, oh, I got in, I beat other people to uh, the finish line, and now I'm on my way. Three months is not at all a longitudinal study. Uh, so they revealed better measures of mental health. So, so these kids are self-reporting that they're not feeling depressed or suicidal, stuff like that. Uh, and as compared with a group randomly assigned to wait the traditional three months, but cross-sex hormones typically don't manifest any outward physiological changes within the three months, meaning that the mental health improvement was not the result of the body becoming a closer resemblance of the opposite sex, but rather it is the placebo effect or the antidepressant effects of testosterone. If they're saying that, it means that it was probably a lot of females. That Wust and Last peddle such misinformation is no cause for surprise given their background. Oh, here we go. Wust is a trans rights activist and a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Last is an Inclusion, Diversity, and Equi Equity and Access Fellow at Stony Brook University. So uh, this is all political for these two authors. More alarmingly, their agitprop was deemed worthy of publication in a peer-reviewed journal, of course. Policymakers rely on peer-reviewed journals to separate fact from fiction. And uh, what I would say is unfortunately with um, uh, the political process, when they're talking about policy makers, they're talking about politicians uh, and medical boards and you know part of various governmental bureaucracies, uh, for the most part these are going to be people who are not going to take the time to look into validity, reliability, uh, longitudinal length, uh, time duration of the study, uh, size, how many participants were there in the study, was it statistically significant, and so on and so on. And also, there are very few places to go outside of City Journal and here and, and uh, you know, uh, a few other places, I guess, Spiked and, and Trigonometry and, and other uh, other sources of information, other journalists. Um, 
you're not going to get the pushback to their poorly designed study. It's not going to be pointed out. Now, just when I was doing my master's degree in special ed and early childhood uh, education, we were taught how to look at these studies to see if they had a statistically significant number of participants and um, to examine really every detail of the setup of this study, the results of which got published. And outside of that as well is the fact that if you don't get the results that the pharma company that's funding this wants, then it will remain unpublished. Uh, many journals fare, fail to maintain rigorous standards and instead serve political agendas under the guise of science. Wust and Last's manuscript does not represent social science and medicines. That's the uh, social science and medicine is the publication. F their first foray into activism. A so-called study published last year, that's 2023, for example, laughably tries to draw a link between exposure to the anti-Black Lives Matter movement with obesity in the black population. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. And in another one uh, had a title, um, this was published in this journal, Social Science and Medicine. Yes, Social Science and Medicine, right. Uh, menstruation, a cyber ethnography of linguistic strategies of trans and non-binary menstruators, meaning young women who do have their periods who have decided that they are trans and non-binary, so they've decided to erase the fact of their female sex. Okay, so in this, this uh, paper, they fret over language that acknowledges the biological reality that only women menstruate. The journal is a purveyor of progressive ideology, not an arbiter of scientific truths. Too many scientific institutions have prioritized the comforting certainties of social justice over the discomfort of living with doubt. More doctors and researchers need to become agents of uncertainty. So Ian Kingsbury, once again, is the director of research for Do No Harm and a senior fellow at the Educational Freedom Institute. Now, I really think that you might as well be talking about prayer in the schools when you're talking about introducing the idea to children that they could have body modifications and take a little vacation from their biological sex. That's all for now. Be sure to get outside and take a walk. And um, this is all very, very new and interesting for me, even to see myself. <laughs> I'm seeing about double the amount of wrinkles that I was seeing before. <laughs> but that's fine. I'm 67. Take care.